itself got results more than anything the cops were allegedly doing. So, you know, I think with this too, it's like the LAPD really set the fucking tone. They are the blueprint for this kind of nightmarish militarized uh, police department that's accountable to nobody and who can't be taken down no matter what for some reason, you know, because they're just like, that is all LAPD invented all that shit. And, and uh, what's his name? Parker, the head of the LAPD. Bill Parker. Yeah. Like he, Whiskey Bill. he really pioneered all this nightmare world that we live in. But yeah, one of the things too about this case is that I, I just from doing organizing know that the LA times you know, is in the pocket of the LAPD and will print whatever the LAPD says happened. And so you also can't trust the LA Times. You also can't, you know, like everybody's in with the LAPD. And so I think you guys do a good job also of just kind of like, well, what actually happened? Like, we know what these, you know, the AP is saying now about, but like, I I think people online too today are like, even really kind of like lib people I've seen today being like, what's up with the missing audio tape in the Texas thing? Like, uh, almost like the cops are covering up shit. Or like, yeah, like the, the, these press conferences they just did where they're just like, just blatantly lying. Like they cannot even get a good liar out there to fucking cover their asses. Yeah. And during the Heidi Flies trial, it was like they were telling conflicting lies and then they had to get their people together and be like, Beverly Hills cops are saying something and the LAPD are saying something else. And like, it's all not true. It's all connecting other murder cases to the Heidi Fly story because they were like, someone's got to be dead, something bad has to have happened so that we can say sex work is bad and nobody should ever do it. And that's not what, went, what was happening. It was like, nobody did die. People did drugs, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like the narrative push towards like, this is bad and here's why it can never happen was so insane. And, and there's never a turn towards like, yeah, it's just like they never say the obvious thing, which is like, what if we, what if we decriminalize sex work? What if the cops didn't have fucking tanks anymore? Like they've shown that they don't do anything good with the tanks and don't know how to use them. I mean, I wasn't aware uh, of the fact that um, she, she was the only, the only one running a like sort of call girl service or escort ring, whatever you want to call it, who who didn't bribe the police. Because I mean, like, like in in one way, like that makes her such a, an attractive target. But like, it it is funny that like for the, uh, like, like any major city police department to, uh, um, make this the issue of public safety, given how notoriously and historically uh, police officers themselves have been, you know, quite frequent uh, patrons of the uh, sex trade or use it as a form of currency among themselves and like, you know, on the streets. Yeah, I mean, I think they just think people don't know that and won't won't care, you know. And again, it's just like if if you're a person who believes whatever the cops say, then the cops will just say whatever. They're just going to lie and be like, well, you better just listen to whatever I'm saying, even though it's blatantly untrue, because like that's how we preserve order. I want to return, though, to um, like uh, uh, Heidi's like like upbringing and family background is just sort of like a way of sort of positioning like, you know, what what made her um, such an uh, like a, an effective like villain in like the public imagination because she was sort of like this rich party girl from a kind of like very privileged background and like that her your father was this kind of like pseudo new agey like uh, like doctor and you know like Molly like from a certain context one could look at this story as like a, you know like a, a a warning about the perils of overly permissive parenting like did you talk about Heidi Heidi's parents and their and like their sort of general parenting philosophy yeah I mean I think it is also a little bit that like I'm also just obsessed with like the children of the you know the failed leftist revolution in California it's like these are like the 80s kids who are like okay well our parents are all hippies they all wanted to make the world better and it didn't work so now we're gonna go full-blown nihilism and just do whatever we want but pretty much everyone in the story like I come back to Charlie Sheen a lot too and Charlie Sheen is another like just yeah child of hippies who like maybe had too much freedom as a kid and but yeah I don't know what I think is interesting about this story too is it's like I I don't have any like hard feelings about like no that you know that this is why kids should have boundaries and rules it's like I don't know. I don't know how to raise a kid and have them not be become a crazy person. Like, it seems like no matter what you do, it's like they're going to just turn into you, you know? It's a roll of the dice one way or the other, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. I will say, though, uh, her father was an anti-circumcision activist, so in that regard, I think he's doing a great job. And, he was uh, like a, he wrote a, 
he wrote a book about it. Being really? like, or, yeah, being like, <laughs> you know, I've been robbed of my foreskin. How do you where do you guys fall on the circumcision debate? Leave those boys alone. Yes. Yes. No, I'm uh, one thousand percent against What's the it. Chapo breakdown? Is anybody is anybody uh so not circumcised? Will, amazingly, growing up on the upper fucking west side of Manhattan, the only one in the fifteen block radius with a foreskin somehow. <laughs> We've were compared your parents our dick. We, we've, were your parents anti-circumcision hippies? I, I, no, I mean, like, I, I guess they just had the, uh, the the humanity and foresight to realize it was an entirely unnecessary medical procedure. <laughs> See, fe- now, Felix, Felix is circumcised. Obviously, he's 900% Jewish. Yes. But I am 0% fucking Jewish, and I got fucking circumcised because when I was born, the conventional medical wisdom was, oh, it's cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> and so... My mom gave birth to me. They popped me out, and they're just like, you want us to go in? And they're just like, yeah. And then they put a little metal cone on the end of the dick, like the the, uh, the cap for uh, the electric chair. <laughs> and they th- twist a little bit. Of th- I didn't get any of the ritual. I didn't get b- brought into a community, like a 5,000-year-old tradition yeah, tied your- to, like, well, like literal I- God. I didn't- I didn't really. Yeah, you get your I, I, I didn't. I, I didn't really either. Like you it was just like, come on, you oh, well, got no, no, it. Okay, your, well, no, no, no. Just, like, just by living, just by well, yeah, by living. living well, family, by living, exactly. yeah, by living, yeah, by knowing like about Vassar College by the time yeah, I was six, I knew that. that. But like knowledge you my actual circum, my actual circumcision was like just some woman, <laughs> which like you know that's not the religious kind. That it wasn't a rabbi. So if if it was just no, it was just some woman. Wasn't she even a doctor. Off, Some broad. Yeah, I, I fucked her um, <laughs> also. So it was not religious. No, it was it was like a it was like a woman that like a doctor, I think. I do think it's really <laughs> it's like interesting. Like, well, it is crazy uh, to think about maybe. like at what point did they start circumcising everybody? Like that's the thing too. Some of his views, I'm like, like he's definitely wrong on some stuff, but some of the stuff too, it's just like, well, again, like who knows? Like, I don't know. Like they had tried raising children by like never being nice to them for a million years and that didn't work. So then they it's were like, true. let's be really yeah. nice to them. And then it was like, Oh no, we were too nice to them. I don't know. You really can't win because you the thing is can't win. your, your, uh, you know, your approach to parenting is going to end up determining how they end up reacting to the world way less than the material conditions that they're going to encounter. That's well, right. You so can yeah, only provide them think, like a, I don't think Heidi, package. I don't think Heidi was a party girl because uh, her dad was a anti-circumcision doctor. I think it was because she grew up with all these Beverly Hills rich girls. And so she was like just incredibly jealous of people who were more privileged than her because she was like upper middle class. Dad's a doctor. She's doing pretty good. But she hung out with these girls who had like so much fucking money. And it was the 80s. You know, it was like, that's what everybody wants. And again, just kind of like to rebel against your hippie parents that just want you to be happy and not materialistic like by being like i'm going to be the most materialistic person in the world but also just like she's so good at making money it's crazy well i want to get into like the way a lot of the ways in which um heidi fleiss um sort of uh anticipated the kind of like uh girl boss grind set like hustle culture but i want to go back around to like the i mean like the the sort of like california ideology and permissive parenting like I, I, when I was reading about it, I was like, I, I, I do like that there's a certain somebody's philosophy of like, don't punish and also don't reward your children. But then I read the incident where she like got drunk and flipped the Jeep her parents gave her, nearly severing her sister's arm. And they were like, okay, well, we'll just get you another Jeep. Don't do that again. It's sort of like, I feel like maybe some, maybe it's time to take the car keys away at that point. Right. Like that's also rich parent stuff too, to be like, oh, you fucked up. Well, let's give you more stuff. And maybe that'll help. Maybe that's, that's what they do with the cops. <laughs> Well, I mean, like you know, maybe it'd be safer for the the eight people inside it when she rolled it. But I like I just once again, like you said, you were like interested in like you know you grew up in in L.A. and like you're interested in like the like California is sort of like the real terminator of like the American dream and American possibility that really represents like the culmination but also end of like the dream of America and also like in the, like the the post hippie era like going into the 80s like how like That's what in I california love. In, in california like all these things like the the esalen institute and like you know uh nude therapy and these these kind of like um like hyper individualistic ways of like uh taking the failed dream of like a like you know leftist revolution in the 60s 
and turning it like turning it inward in this like very like self focused uh, sort of new age new age era. Right, like I'm obsessed with that because I think that's where the revolution fails. Right, is when everybody stops doing anything collective and it turns into let's all become the best versions of ourselves. And I don't yeah. know if you guys know there's like a the, I don't know if I believe it, but there's a theory that the CIA invented acid for that reason that they were. I mean, like, it certainly <laughs> utilized it. Well, they were like, we got to get the hippies. We got to get the hippies to stop like threatening to blow up the banks and stuff and the stuff that's actually going to like do stuff and get them to just chill out. Have a nice vibe. At the same time, I mean, it's also just the consequence of, you know, the broader left just cracking up and not being able to affect anything. For Uh, sure. But like if if you're if you're that situation, the the only rational thing to do is to try to work on yourself because you know yeah i what, mean what else, I, what else what fruitful action can you engage in yeah i mean there's a it's it's crazy though because i do feel like also the mythology of it has gotten so like you know there's this kind of idea that the 60s ended in la with the manson family murders and that that was like the end of innocence and you know people closed their doors and and hired security and stuff but mike davis who is you know who would know he was like, well, that's not what happened. Like, what happened is that the CIA assassinated the Black Panthers in Los Angeles. And, you know, like, it, it wasn't just like, oh, everyone's tired of trying. So now we're going to, like, go inside. It was like, no, the government was trying to crush all this stuff. And especially in L.A., it's like, like in Berkeley, you know, they kind of revere their history, even if they don't do anything about it. It's like they have plaques and and, you know talk about the 60s a lot in LA it's very like let's pretend this never happened let's pretend that this never that the Watts riots never happened and then let's pretend that the LA riots never happened because we can't actually like deal with all the fucking shit here and be like hey this is like a really racist really segregated really extreme in terms of class place and because it's LA there's always this focus on like well what does it look like for a camera so, you know, the Heidi trial, too, they were just like and, and the OJ trial. It's like they were like, let's show that L.A. is like a place where law and order prevail. And then people just rejected the narrative with both of it because they were like, well, you know, with the with the OJ trial, it was just like, again, they were like, well, why are they busting this one rich black guy when white guys, rich white guys are like getting away with murder, you know, in many ways, like every day here. Yeah, and uh, just just a, just a bit of advice: if you are a rich white guy interested in murdering your wife, buy a boat. I am fully convinced that like rich people own boats so that they can murder their spouses. That is a hundred percent true. <laughs> I mean, also there's like I feel like people think there's no law on the ocean, which is that's like what the Scientologists uh, uh, kind of say. A, it's, it's a maritime law. It's a well, right, maritime law. law. <laughs> but that's why the science. That's like why L. Ron Hubbard was obsessed with like going to the sea. Because he was like, fuck these earth rules. We're going to go to the ocean where the law can't find us. And I really think that's what Elon Musk is, is thinks, too. I think, he, I think he thinks there's no laws in space. Well, I mean, there are no laws in space technically, but what right. there is is a, is a ton of solar radiation. So, I mean, you know, it's like, take, take, pick your poison here. I think Elon Musk thinks that, like, as soon as you get to space, you can, like, fuck a kid and it's okay because there's no rules <laughs> in space, you know? That would, I mean, uh, the, the, yeah, the, that, that would seem to point to their... That's uh, the libertarian the dream is to fuck children <laughs> in space and no one can <laughs> tell you not to because you're in space now. And, but also have a space force to protect your space property. <laughs> yeah. I love um, reading about what actually happens when you go to space because it is, like, it's your every, brain... Melts. You just die. You're like, it's you just, just die. There's no way. To, yeah, it's like everything. It Nobody's going to Mars. Hostile. Yeah, yeah. I love exactly. the idea Get of all it. the, the rich guys it. going yeah. to Mars and just their brains melting. It's just total recall. Everything is just the worst Paul Verhoeven version of reality we could be living in. 